there everyone, it's so great to have you with us today to worship Jesus together. It's a bit of a strange Sunday, we're obviously really sad that we're not able to host our in-person gatherings um, for the next few weeks because of the lockdown and we're so aware that for so many of us this is really a really sad time, it's a really frustrating time and really what we want to be doing is gathering together but we just need to be reminded that despite all that's going on, despite the uncertainty, despite the frustration that Jesus is still good, he is still with us and he still loves to meet with us. So we just welcome him here amongst us this morning and we're really still looking forward to worshipping together despite all that's going on. Um, so today is of course our gift day, our November gift day, that time where we respond to the generosity that God has shown us by responding ourselves in generosity and giving to the ministry and mission of the church at Redland. I really hope you've had an opportunity to maybe pray about what your response will be today. Hopefully you've got the information that went out this week. Um, there's a link in the description to that for ways in which you could give. And we'd love to just invite you into this kind of opportunity to, to give, to be generous and to respond to the generosity of our good God. And so we'd love you to be praying about what your response might be to that today. So you're probably thinking, what happened to Katie? Um, we missed an announcement out that we really, really wanted to include, um, and she's not around to film it, so you've just got me for 10 seconds and then she'll magically appear back. Um, but we're so excited that this week, Steve Truscott, we love Steve Truscott, is launching the midweek community kind of weekly service. That's a time for some of our oldest members to gather to worship Jesus together on Zoom. And so we're really excited about this. If you'd like to be part of that and you're not already, um, do get in touch with Steve. Um, his email will be in the uh, video description below because we'd love for you to join in with that. We're really looking forward to later in the service having Claire Nichols speak to us. Really looking forward to hearing from her. And also just to make you aware that Obviously today is Remembrance Sunday, um, so later on in the service we will be having a two minute silence to just reflect and pray and remember. So just to kind of make you aware of that. I'm gonna pray for us now as we, as we come to worship Jesus together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God who is always with us. You are Emmanuel, you are with us by our spirit right now. We might not be together in person, but you unite us, Lord, in you. Thank you that whoever we are, wherever we are, you are with us. And I just pray you remind us and draw us deeper into that reality this morning as we worship you. Amen.
Morning, uh, Redland. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is James. I'm married to Brittany, the youth minister. Um, she told me to say minister, not pastor. I always call her a youth pastor. And Will has asked me this morning to talk to you a little bit about Remembrance Sunday and what Remembrance Sunday means to me. Uh, the reason he's asked me is I've been a member of the Royal Navy for over 20 years now. Um, and so I think he just wants a little bit of a perspective from the point of view of a serving member. Now, traditionally, Remembrance Sunday is a time when we call to mind World War I, World War II, um, World War I known as the Great War, World War II, where between 70 and 85 million people are estimated to have died. And the fact that the difference between the estimates is 15 million people. It's just absolutely flabbergasting and just shows how absolutely devastating that war was. What an impact it had on not only Europe, but most of the world. But actually, Remembrance Sunday is a time to 
think about and remember the service men and women who have served in not only those wars but more recent wars and the ones that spring to mind the ones that i've had first-hand experience of uh, iraq and afghanistan and actually we still have men and women serving in iraq today um, in the fight against isil and some of the things that i personally think about and want to call to your mind are the men and women who've come back from those wars many broken with limbs lost people who stood on ieds suffered horrific injuries and not only physical injuries but actually traumatic mental illnesses mental scars that they carry with them now and will carry with them for the rest of their life and in fact the death toll from suicide is greater than the death toll from military action from the iraq war so more people have died who served in iraq since the war from suicide than actually died in the war and it's not only them but it's their families and so over these next two minutes these next two minutes of remembrance i'd like you to to pray to ask god to talk to jesus and to ask him to stand with these men and women stand with them wherever they are throughout the world uh, to stand with their families to be in their families hearts in their families minds and to just let them know that they're wrapped in the comfort of his love Let's join now in a special prayer of confession for this day of remembrance. God of peace, forgive us when we have participated in that which turns people against each other, for fueling anger and harbouring vengeance, for not heeding your call to love one another. Inspire us never to give up on the hope that your life offers us and the courage to see past war and desolation and live for the day when it will be peace. Amen. They say, don't you, don't they, that um, if you remember the 1960s, you weren't there. Um, if you were there, then you shouldn't be able to remember it. 
Uh, well, I was there. And um, when I was thinking about uh, this talk, what I remembered from the 1960s was hippie communes. Um, I don't know if you know, the, there was a culture where people got together in quite big groups sometimes, usually a mixture of families and younger single folk and maybe some older folk as well. And they lived together. Um, they shared everything. So they shared their income if they had any. They shared the chores. Uh, they shared the joys and sorrows, no doubt. Um, they shared other things, which perhaps we won't go into here. Um, and they did it 24 seven, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, now, I don't know what you think about that. Um, it sounds pretty scary to me, having no privacy at all. Um, and interestingly, I Googled hippie communes when I was preparing this, and there are still hippie communes, um, some in England, mostly in Europe and other parts of the world. So people still do this. Um, and I said that I, I was a schoolgirl in the 1960s, so you could work out how old I am. Um, and for a while I boarded. Um, in my case, it was an all girls school uh, and it was a fairly small boarding house in, in the context of a larger school. Um, and so we uh, experienced community living, uh, slightly odd, all girls aged between, I don't know, about seven and 17. Um, and you can imagine how that got, got all those um, adolescent females all together. Later on, as an adult, um, Jerry and I um, spent six months in Singapore living at OMF headquarters. So that's a large missionary organisation in the Far East. And we experienced communal living there uh, with lots of other Christians, uh, not just Christians, people committed to missionary service. Uh, we did have our own flat, so our own space, uh, but we very much lived together. And that was an interesting experience. And again, some of it was wonderful. Uh, and some of it was really difficult. Um, and we're thinking about uh, community and doing things together uh, in our series in discipleship this morning. And uh, the scripture that I wanted to share with you comes from the book of Acts, which is Luke's description uh, of the early church. And in particular, this passage, which is in Acts 2, beginning at verse 42, uh, talks about the response of people to Peter's sermon at Pentecost. So this is Acts chapter two, beginning at verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So that's um, Luke's description of the early church. And as I say, it's the outcome of Peter's preaching the good news on the day of Pentecost. And this is a description, if, if you like, of the culture of the very early Christian church. And it was built on many centuries of the religious culture of God's chosen people, the Jews. So it didn't just come out of the blue. Um, we talk about Pentecost being the birthday of the church. Actually, that's not quite true because the church had existed for centuries. Uh, this was the birthday of the New Testament, the New Covenant Christian church. And these early Christians in Jerusalem continued going to the temple, the main centre of Jewish worship. They also met in their homes, presumably for more informal gatherings. So what went on in this community that was so attractive to the rest of society in Jerusalem? What was it that just struck people as being so different and wonderful? Well, if we look at the passage, firstly, the members of this community were devoted so we use devoted in terms of relationships, don't we? People being devoted to one another. Couples have been married for very many years. This is more in the sense of devoted in the religious sense, in that they were um, one track minded. So they were devoted. They were entirely in this thing. They'd accepted the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost, the good news of the gospel, and they became committed fully to the new way. Peter had pleaded with them to save themselves from this corrupt generation. You can read that in verse 40. 
Those who responded weren't just joining a club, they were entering into a whole new way of life. They were becoming disciples of Jesus. Friends, nothing's changed really, has it? When we accept the gospel, we accept Jesus's lordship over our lives and it means entering into a lifetime commitment. You can't really dabble, can you? When you accept that lifetime community, then you're committed to, Je to the Jesus family, if you like, the church. And we need to prioritise spending time with Jesus and with his church. So what do you think of that phrase, this corrupt generation, as a way of describing society in the West? Again, things haven't really changed, have they? Secondly, these new Christians were a learning community. They devoted themselves not just to the group, the community, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They wanted to learn more about this Jesus and about what following him meant. They weren't leaving their intellect behind. It wasn't just an experience. They weren't having a good time. Well, they may have been having a good time, but it was also about learning more. The tradition of being yoked to the rabbi or teacher continued. There was that tradition that if you followed a rabbi, you were kind of joined at the hip, really. You did everything together. You ate together, you talked together, you learnt. And they had the apostles there in the flesh. So the apostles were the people who had actually witnessed Jesus's life on earth. Think of that. People who had been with Jesus, who had walked and talked and eaten with him, witnessed his death on the cross for their sins and seen him alive after the resurrection. So this whole series is about our discipleship, as I said, our apprenticeship to Jesus. Sadly, we can't listen to the apostles in the flesh, but we do have the New Testament word of God as our text. And we can experience Jesus's presence with us, both individually and when we meet together. There is almost nothing in Acts about individuals' relationship with Jesus. It's all about community, the church, the Jesus family. So how do we know, how did they know then, that this was all real and God-inspired? Well, the Holy Spirit enabled the apostles to perform signs and wonders, miracles of healing and restoration. So we can be sure that this was the real thing. As we study God's word and spend time with Jesus, God's spirit's still at work. He's here now speaking to you as I speak. Well, I hope he is. What you hear may well be something quite different from what I think I'm saying to you. I have had that experience. People come to you at the door of the church and say, that was a nice talk. And then they tell you something that they heard that you and you think, did I say that? I didn't mean to say that. God's spirit is at work. He speaks. And that's what the spirit does. He leads us into all truth. And he's powerful to change us from the inside out to become more like Jesus. But we do have to give him the chance. We have to let him in. We have to allow him to work. Now, I think the whole subject of signs and wonders can be a bit challenging for us in nice middle class Redland in the 21st century. The spirit hasn't changed since Pentecost. He's still powerful and signs and wonders certainly occur in other parts of the Christian church and in other parts of the world. In the early days, these things were normative and perhaps they were necessary to establish the church and confirm its validity. Have we lost the expectation that God will work in power? Or does he work in quieter ways for a reason? I think the temptation is to say, oh, that doesn't happen anymore. That's not for us. We look for ways to excuse the fact that it doesn't apparently happen or not in our community. But of course, we see the Spirit's power at work every time anyone turns to Jesus and commits their life to him. We see his power at work in answered prayer, in lives turned around, in myriad other ways. But perhaps we do need to be more expectant, more positive, more allowing of the Spirit's work. So thirdly, this was a loving, caring, sharing community. They were together, they shared fellowship, they shared hospitality, they shared resources, 
some selling goods and property so that everyone had enough. Nobody was in need. And they were joyful in this, weren't they? Not grudging or reluctant. It was heartfelt and genuine. And this was incredibly attractive to the culture around them. Jewish tradition had for many, many years emphasised care for the needy and love for God and neighbour. But this would have been very different from the prevailing Roman culture, where everyone basically looked after themselves and the poor and needy went to the wall. And it doesn't look as though everyone sold everything. Don't worry, I'm not asking you to go and sell everything and give it all to the church. They continued to meet in one another's houses, so some hung on to their homes, but they did respond in love when there was need, and they were generous with what they had. Now today is our gift day when we think about giving specially to the work of God's church here in Redland. And maybe we need to be thinking about how generous God is to us. That's our opportunity today, isn't it? To reflect on God's generosity to us and respond in generosity to his work. And of course, this sounds wonderful. This picture of the early church and no one being in need and everybody being generous. Uh, but we know it didn't always go smoothly. These are imperfect human beings, after all, just like us. Jealousies arose between different ethnicities. People kept money back and lied about it. I'm sure people fell out with each other. But underneath it all was a sense of being in community, being in relationship with each other and with Jesus. This is what following Jesus is all about. When we begin to follow him, we become part of his families and families want to be together, mostly. Many of us will be thinking about Christmas at the moment and wondering whether we will be able to be together with our human families, let alone the church family. There are always challenges, aren't there? But especially now in this strange time of COVID, it's quite hard to feel like a community when opportunities to meet physically are limited. But you're part of your human family, even if you only see them infrequently. And it's the same with the family of God. Now, we've been part of this church for more years than I care to remember, and we've personally experienced the support and love of God's family. And of course, it's not always plain sailing. Of course, we sometimes fall out. Of course, we sometimes have differences. But it's family. We support one another. We love one another. We look after one another in physical ways. And we look after one another in spiritual ways in that we pray for each other and support one another spiritually. So even in this difficult time, we find ways of keeping in touch. We pray for each other. We share stuff on social media, what other people do. We try to be aware of individuals' needs. And it works both ways, doesn't it? If we as individuals have troubles, then we need to be ready to share. We need to make ourselves vulnerable. You can't be supported if people don't know that you have needs. So it's really good to be part of a small group. You don't always want to share everything with the whole church, do you? The evangelical tradition in Christianity has tended to emphasise individual salvation and developing a personal relationship with Jesus, and that is the bedrock of being a Christian. But the New Testament is clear that we're all in this together. Discipleship, growing to be more like Jesus, is something we do together. We're part of the body of Christ. We follow a relational God, don't we? Father, Son and Holy Spirit, three in one. We're made for relationship with God, with our fellow Christians. Fourthly, these early Christians were a worshipping community. They met to share bread and wine as instructed by Jesus, what we call communion. And they met to pray together and to praise God. We know they sang psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We do miss that, don't we? They were joyful and exuberant, but they were also reverent and worshipful. They probably met for more formal occasions in the temple and for less formal, more exciting gatherings in their homes. It sounds like there was definitely a mixture of different opportunities. That's something for us at Redland to bear in mind, isn't it, as we look to the future of our patterns of worship in this church family. And everyone in this early church was filled with awe. 
So presumably that was inside, those inside the church and those outside the church. I guess some of this was to do with the signs and wonders. If you see miracles being done, people being uh, made better, all sorts of other things, things being moved around, then that, you are a bit awestruck, aren't you? But maybe it was the whole setup because it was so different, because people were living out differently from the surrounding culture. And it was attractive. They were looking after each other. People were flourishing. Now, I wonder if the church in this country fills anyone with awe. If what we do as a community is about pointing people to God, it should, shouldn't it? We've got an awesome God, no question about that. I once asked my partner at work, the GP who trained me, why he no longer had anything to do with the church. He'd grown up in it, he'd been a choir boy. And his response was that all he could see was people disagreeing with each other and infighting, and that wasn't very attractive. How we function as a community really matters. I think at Redland, we are generally a welcoming, unified, loving community, and that's great, but it's challenging at present, as I said. How can we be more of a positive presence in the community? How can the way we live point to God and encourage people to want to know more about his, about him, even in these difficult times. Finally, the early church in Jerusalem was an evangelistic community. They wanted to share what they'd found with others. And as a result, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Not just a few, hundreds. Just imagine, what would we do with them all? And as far as we know, this community didn't put on special missions. They didn't go out door to door. They didn't have training courses on evangelism. They just lived the gospel. The apostles preached the gospel, the good news of Jesus, probably in the temple courts and also within their worship meetings. Everyone was so excited by this new way that they probably talked about it all the time. It's like when you have a new boyfriend. That was a long time ago or get engaged. You want to tell everyone. At the risk of boring your friends rigid, you go on and on. You can think of similar circumstances. A new baby, first grandchild, new job even. You can't keep it to yourself, can you? Because you're so thrilled. Have we mostly become a bit comfortable with our faith? Is our relationship with Jesus a bit stale, a bit ordinary? Do we find it difficult to talk about Jesus because it's really a bit embarrassing? How can we as individuals and as a church family regain that thrill about our relationship with Jesus that overflows into sharing it with others and into loving service of others? I believe that's something that our gatherings as church should help with. We should be equipping ourselves as we meet week by week to share Jesus with our family, friends and neighbours not by learning techniques, but just by being thrilled with what Jesus is doing in our lives, individually and corporately. And it starts by sharing with fellow Christians in small groups, in hubs, wherever you meet, on Zoom or in person. It, meets, it begins with being accountable, with developing the language to talk about what Jesus is doing in our lives. And then we can go out more confidently. We need at heart to remind ourselves of what Luke says in verse 47. The Lord added to their number. It's God's work to add new members to his church, mercifully. He graciously allows us to play our part. But God, by his Holy Spirit, does the work of salvation, of bringing people into his kingdom. We can't persuade folk by our arguments, although we may need to have those arguments and we shouldn't be afraid of them. God can use, thankfully, even our most feeble efforts to share what he's doing in our lives. But he does expect us to play our part. So this is a challenging part of the Bible, isn't it? It sounds utopian. A community of people living, loving, worshipping and sharing together, experiencing the power of God in wonderful ways and growing daily because it was so attractive to outsiders. It's easy to look at the description and conclude that this was what things were like then. 
they couldn't possibly be like that now. There are so many things that get in the way, aren't there? Our, individual cult our individualistic culture, our need to hang on to our possessions, our lifestyles, our personal ambitions. Covid gets in the way, but maybe we can use that as an excuse. Maybe we need to look at what we can expect Jesus' church to be like now. We can be a learning community. That's what's happening now, hopefully. Well, I'm teaching, hopefully. And we can learn together in other ways through the week as we meet in small groups. We can love one another and show it in a myriad of practical ways, making sure no one's needs are neglected. We can pray for each other. We can worship together pray together and share communion, albeit to a limited extent at the moment. But first, we have to be clear that we've separated ourselves from what Peter called this corrupt generation. We need to begin to live counterculturally. Now, that doesn't mean going into a monastery and living completely separately, at least not for most of us. There are still people who are called to do that. It might mean making some uncomfortable changes behaving obviously differently in a way that might be difficult uh, at work, at home, at school, at college. For some, joining the church, becoming committed to the Jesus community may be a very difficult thing. If you've never done commitment, and certainly not to a group of weird people who have strange rituals and may have views that you regard as off the wall. But remember, Christians are just people who love Jesus and try to love each other with his help. Those of us who have followed Jesus for very many years can testify that it isn't always easy. Jesus never promised us an easy life, but it is worth it. And he promised that he would always be with us. And Jesus keeps his promises. Well, good morning, church. It's great to be with you, even though this is a strange way. Um, if we've not met yet, my name's David. And we've come to the point in our service where we pray together. And we've just heard about the description of the early followers of Jesus who devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, the breaking the bread and the prayers. And although it's 2,000 years later, in the middle of a second lockdown of a global pandemic, it's our privilege to come before God and to pray, knowing that he hears us and that it makes a difference. So I just invite you to get into a posture where you feel like you can pray, and together we're going to invite God to come and speak to us as we make petition to him. So come Holy Spirit. Come and teach us to pray. Lord, it's our privilege to come before your throne of grace this morning. Knowing that you hear us. And you call us deeper. Lord, today we want to agree with you with the way that you see the world. We want to agree with your will for, for our lives, for Bristol, for the world. And we pray, come Lord Jesus, we need you. And we turn our attention towards the, the lockdown that we find ourselves in. And Lord, we ask that you would come and, and meet with us in this time. Would you make us aware of the needs of others in a fresh way? Lord, we heard in the, in the talk about the, the, the generosity of your people in Acts. Father, I ask that you would cause your church to be a generous body once again. That we would give to all those who are in need. Lord, we pray for your provision for those people who are in lack at the moment. In our community and across the world, Lord. We bring before you those people we know who are particularly feeling anxious or worried at the moment. Jesus, we thank you for your care over us. Lord, if you, if you clothe the lilies and you provide for the sparrows, how much more will you provide for us? I pray, Lord, that you would teach us to trust in you in this time. Father, we pray for those people who are really affected by this this um, latest lockdown. Lord, for the people that are finding themselves jobless or homeless or in vulnerable situations, we pray, Lord, for your grace and for your deliverance. 
we continue, Lord, to pray for a vaccine against this virus. We pray that the, the loss of life would be prevented and that the isolated would find a home in you. Lord, we pray for our leaders and for the scientists working uh, on, on different medical approaches. Lord, we pray for an outpouring of your grace on those people. And now we just bring before you those people we know, maybe our neighbours, maybe people we work with. Lord, you know their needs and we bring them before you today, asking that you would pour out your spirit. And now, Lord, on this Remembrance Sunday, we want to remember with gratitude those people who gave their lives that we might have the life we now live. Jesus, we thank you that you're the Prince of Peace and that you're going to come and establish peace one day. And we long for that every day, Lord. We pray that where there's war and conflict, you would bring your peace and your reconciliation. We pray, Lord, for those people who are um, living with the effects of war. Lord, would you comfort the grieving would you provide for those people who are displaced? We bring before you especially the, the refugee crisis that, we, that, it, that so much of the world is in at the moment. Lord, you know each of their names. You know their needs. And we pray, Lord, for your provision for them. Jesus, you know what it's like to be a refugee. And we pray, would you pour out your spirit that we might be a, a generous people Lord, would you change the systems that need changing? And would you soften hearts that need softening? We pray, Lord, for your peace to be established on this earth, for reconciliation to be known. We pray for our leaders that they might live as people of peace. And now we pray for the election in the US and for all the turbulence that that has brought. Father, we pray for your kingdom to be established. Lord, we pray for unity in that nation and peace. Lord, whoever wins, I pray for your grace on them. Thank you, Lord, that you are in control. And we ask for your blessing over that nation and over, that, over the leadership. And also, Lord, we want to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters. Lord, we ask for your grace on them. And now let's just have a moment of silence and I invite you to, to bring um, the needs of people who you know. Maybe they're ill or in need of God's comfort. Father, we thank you that you know their names. We lift them before you now, Lord, asking that you would show them your kindness and your grace. And as we close our time of prayer, let's say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus.
Yeah, Jesus, we thank you that you are our hope in times of struggle, in times of unrest, in times of war, in times of strife. You are always our hope. You know, no matter what we can or cannot see, we have hope because we know you and we know your promises are true. And so be with us this week, I pray, as we go from this place of worship um, to lift you in this world. Um, remind us of your presence with us and your love for us, I pray. Amen. Amen. 
Straight um, after the service at 11.30, we are having our post-church Zoom catch-up. We would love to have as many of you as possible joining us on that today. Obviously, we can't be meeting together, so it's a great opportunity to just gather and um, catch up and encourage each other and just see some familiar faces together. So we'd love for you to join us for that if you can. Um, and if not, we will see you next week. Have a fantastic week and we'll see you then. Bye. Bye.